All right, hey, good morning. Tim Solzner here. You just uh, heard from me a little while ago. We got a special presentation uh, this morning from uh, Major Garrett Gingrich. He's also uh, a firefighter. On the, oh, that's what he does for a living. He's an outstanding officer, and uh, we're lucky to have him, not only in the 34th Infantry Division, but you know, as a leader, some of the things he's accomplished through his career. Now, Major Gingrich has done uh, several assignments. He grew up in the 133, as I did. Um, several deployments, to include the long one to Iraq, right? So, yes, sir. They, that's where they renamed themselves the Iron Man Battalion, like in World War II, except in Iraq they spent 22 months there. They were extended during the, uh, during the surge. So he was part of that, but he also deployed as a company commander to Afghanistan in 2010 and 11, which he was in, um, what's the name of the province there? Logman, Logman, Logman province. And Nuristan, which you're going to hear more about. Um, he was either lucky or unfortunate enough to be one of the first people on the ground in the Battle of Doab, which will go down in history as the largest battle for the 34th Infantry Division since World War II. Um, so without further ado, let me uh, hand it off to Major Gingrich to talk about the Battle of Doab. Thanks, Dean. Uh, thank you, guys. Thanks. It's an honor to be here uh, with uh, such a distinguished pr uh, crowd and uh, to be able to talk about some of the things that we've done with the 34th in the 34th Infantry Division. Um, I was going to start off with a joke because my boss is here. Uh, why, why did uh, Why did God create firemen? Does anybody know? No because why. police need heroes too. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so his I. Boss is, uh, his yeah. boss is a policeman. Yeah, yeah right. my my uh, my boss is uh, soon to be Colonel Nixon, and he's a police officer in Iowa City. He's soon to retire. So uh, I would I had a high speed presentation set up for you guys, oh. some pictures, and I uh, I will try it. And I failed to uh, assume that I couldn't use my military computer with uh, a thumb drive, so uh, here we are. I'll try to be as descriptive as possible with what happened at DOAB, kind of explain to you guys the way that it occurred and what happened. Um, like like uh, the Colonel said, yeah, I'm a firefighter in Waterloo. Um, I, I'm married to my wife, Angie, and uh, I have a one-year-old and a four-year-old four at home, so. Um, so really, our mission uh, that morning, it all, it all really occurred, uh, unbeknownst to a lot of us, that we were going to do this the morning that it, that it did happen. So on 25 uh, May uh, 2011, we were given a mission to basically go conduct a recon of Doab uh, district in uh, Afghanistan. So uh, I'll try to illustrate. I have pictures, but... Uh, a few of the things that were considerations here uh, were the lack of preparation. Uh, we got the notification that we're going to do this or receive a mission that morning. Um, we had around two to four hours to prepare for uh, our air assault that we're going to conduct into DOAG to conduct this reconnaissance. Um, as far as intel reports, uh, there, there's an unspecified number of uh, Taliban insurgents that had moved into the Doab district, which is to the north of uh, where my combat outpost was, and they were basically uh, gathering uh, to try to do follow-on attacks onto coalition forces. Um, to break down in Afghanistan what our mission was, uh, we were dispersed throughout mostly Logman province uh, in Afghanistan, which is RCE, so it's on the east side, it's east of Kabul, uh, and it's between the border border of uh, Pakistan and, uh, and Kabul. Uh, so we were uh, in the Hindu Kush, or the start of the Hindu Kush mountains. Um, so the Hindu Kush mountains are really anywhere from 11,500 feet to about 14,800 feet. Uh, and that was the kind of the terrain and the operating environment that we were operating in. 
Um, we uh, found out that morning that we're going to have a battalion uh, group team of a platoon sized force, aerial assault force, to conduct an uh, air assault to go to Doab District, which is to the north of Combat Outpost Calagouche. And really, um, Doab District is very remote. Uh, so, Coalition forces hadn't been there for, for quite some time, and uh, there's no way to travel there with our vehicles. Our MRAP, our mine resistant ambush protected vehicles, uh, were not able to drive up there because literally the roads that access to Doeb, uh, they're carved along mountain faces and cliffs of a river valley. Um, so yeah, it, it, it just wasn't possible to go up there. We didn't know what was going on and we were given, basically the battalion, uh, in my understanding, was given the order, you're going to go up there and you're going to find out what's going on. So um, just probably maybe what he doesn't know, the battalion was ordered to do this and it came from President Karzai who got the call from the Doab district mm -hmm. to General Petraeus and it was of course, we get the mission as a battalion, and we're, but we need to plan this. No, the helicopters are on the way. You got three hours to do it. Okay, yeah. I mean, Major it like Genrich, that. would you repeat that so we get it on the on the tape? Go ahead, just say what what uh, Colonel Nixon said. Uh, basically, that this was an order that came from uh, basically higher headquarters ISAF uh, from President Karzai, the Afghan president, to uh, General Petraeus that you're going to conduct this operation and you're going to go up there and do this. Um, so that is context that I really wasn't aware of. I just knew that I was given an order and this is what you're going to execute. Did you know at the time when you did your real quick mission briefing that this was in our AOR but it was not an area of interest and we had no operations, no intel? Uh, we, I, I knew that uh, we had very little intel and as far as imagery or anything else that was going on. At Calagouche, um, which it's 13, it's roughly 13 miles as the crow flies mm -hmm. to the northwest of Calagouche. Um, we could see fires. We could see an increased presence up north. Um, so we knew that something was going on, and we were getting um, intel reports from uh, the Afghan National Police and other things that were leading us to, to realize, yeah, something's going on up there, but we don't know what's going on. Uh, we I'll we were up one thing then. So who was your division headquarters and brigade that gave you the order to go in? Uh, that was First Cav. First Cav uh, Division. Uh, yep. Out of Fort Hood. Fort Hood. Fort Hood, Fort Hood Texas. Yep. Okay. And then it came through. Came and it through, came through. Uh, well, it came through the brigade headquarters, and the brigade headquarters didn't want to touch it. And that's Second BCT. I want to make this clear for the tape. The second BCT. Yep. Okay. Second BCT. Which was Colonel Correll. Good. Yep. Okay. Go on. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, no, some of the, I'm learning some stuff today, too. So this is good. Alan said you will do this. Yeah. Um, and who was General Allen? Uh, General Allen was the, I, was he the ISAF commander? He was the no, first cab. First, first, first cab commander, commander at the time. First yeah, ISAF commander was uh, the training. He was the coalition okay. commander. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, very good. Uh, so, uh, find out what the situation was in the district center. That's what we're going to find out. Um, key people that we needed to talk to and that we were going to meet with as soon as we air assaulted in there was the, uh, the district sub-governor of uh, DOAB and the district police chief, um, which didn't occur until after the battle had happened. Um, <laughs> the yes. Uh, basically, we had the, in the platoon, as far as U.S. soldiers, we had 38 U.S. U.S. Uh, service members, uniformed service members. We had one law enforcement professional that went with us. Uh, we had two Afghan interpreters. Uh, and then we had a, an Afghan platoon of 20 Afghan soldiers, which for context, uh, they were very <coughs> disciplined and very, pretty much just bogged us down, didn't really help us a whole lot. They were ter pretty much terrible soldiers. Um, our, our uh, battalion assault force included our battalion S3, who was basically the TAC on the ground, and he was the senior ranking uh, military person there, uh, which is uh, Major Aaron Bauer. A lot of you probably know uh, Major Aaron Bauer. Uh, the battalions, our battalion scout platoon, um, which was uh, first lieutenant at the time, Justin Foote, um, now Captain Foote, 
Uh, we had six snipers that were with us with M14 rifles, and, and so we had that capability. Uh, we had three battalion mortarmen uh, led by our uh, mortar platoon leader, Terry Dunn, First Lieutenant Terry Dunn, uh, and then they had an interpreter. As far as my company and my element uh, that I led up there, we had a TAC-P, which is our uh, tactical air control party, uh, which consisted of our uh, JTAC, our joint tactical air controller, who was very key in this battle, and his ROMAD. A ROMAD is a radio operator, uh, maintainer, and driver is what that is. Uh, but he's basically this right-hand man of that JTAC and being able to utilize in close air support. Uh, we also had a joint fires observer uh, who was Luke Chatfield from Floyd, Iowa. Um, he, he did an excellent job. And uh, he was there uh, also helping with fires, indirect, indirect fire support. Um, basically, uh, he was there use, utilizing close combat aviation, or our Apaches and our uh, OH-58 Kiowas. He was basically uh, identifying targets and utilizing uh, them. Uh, we had our law enforcement professional that was there to help us deal with the Afghan National Police uh, when we came down to discussions. Uh, and I had my intel analyst, my lead intel analyst was there to basically document, and he was my battle tracker on the ground. Uh, my interpreter was there, a good friend of mine, Jawad Zafar. He's now in the United States uh, doing, doing very well. Uh, we, so we had these increased intelligence reports of what's going on up there. Repeated calls from them to come up and support us. So before we even were given the order, we were getting calls from the DOAB chief of police and the sub governor, hey, we need help. Bring, Bring people up here. Uh, uh, we need support. Um, so we did, as you know. I have a map showing uh, Afghanistan. Um, and uh, so a little more context of what is happening in, uh, in RC East and where we were at. So uh, the very tip of Nuristan province is to, to the north of Lodman province where, uh, where we were located. Years prior, uh, in, two years prior, in, uh, in Kamdesh, which is eastern Nuristan, uh, they had the Battle of Wanat first, and then the Battle of Keating, Kop Keating. So you had the Battle of Combat Outpost, uh, Wanat, which was over uh, north side of Kunar province, and then we had the Battle of uh, Kop Keating. These, are two, uh, these were two battles that occurred in the two years prior where uh, U.S. forces were basically overrun. They were overrun, and those combat outposts were basically folded up, and that terrain was basically just given back to the Afghans. Um, so the only remaining uh, U.S. base that was in Nuristan at the time now was where Charlie Company 133 was at, which is... Cop, uh, combat Outpost Kalagoosh in, uh, in the very southwest portion of Nuristan province. Um, so we were getting uh, increasing intelligent re intelligence reports <coughs> that uh, the Taliban shadow subgovernor, shadow subgovernor of Nuristan wanted to kick all remaining coalition forces out of Nuristan. Um, he was, his name was Dost Mohammed. Mohammed. And if, if a lot of you guys may recall, recall after the battle of, uh, I believe it was Keating, Cop Keating, he was the Taliban guy in all his man jammies that was on an elliptical machine mm -hmm. in, the, in, the in their workout room. Yeah. So uh, they were, we were getting reports that they wanted to move down onto Kalagoosh and basically repel all U.S. forces out of Nuristan. Um, so th that's kind of the context of this. Uh, fortunately for us, or unfortunately, because we went through the situation, that never occurred based on what happened at the Battle of Doab. So I might stick with that and see what we got next. Uh, so the next thing is the terrain. It, it was this incredible, incredible mountain terrain, um, and it was a very, uh, very mountainous, rugged terrain. The Battle of Doab occurred. Uh, at the district center location, which is also adjacent to the, bat, the village of Junia. Junia was a little village, and it was, it was stretched all across a cliff face or a spur of a, of, a, of a mountain. So the HLZ, which we called LZ Eagle, 
was the only LZ that was possible for miles upon miles. It's the only place where you could land helicopters, really two at the most in one location, uh, and it was right there. That's it. So uh, the district was along the river. The district center was along the river just to the north of the LZ, 600 meters. And this basically was all in a valley uh, with mountains just on each side overlooking the HLZ. Lots of rocks. Yeah. Uh, so as soon as we landed, I believe that they, they led us onto the hot, hot LZ, and then they didn't open up on us until we had basically the majority of our forces on the ground. Then they executed, they opened up on us. Uh, so basically what we dealt with was uh, small arms fire, RPGs, a few RPGs uh, detonated right over top of the, of the aircraft, um, mortar fire, uh, rockets, Chinese rockets, and, uh, and then PKM, RPK fire. Um, so 360 degrees, we were taking fire from all, basically all around the mountains. From what I remember, the majority of it came from uh, the northeast of the LZ and then also from the village, Junior, junior Village. And, um, and it, was, it was pretty much mass chaos on the LZ. As the aircraft left, the aircraft all sustained some pretty significant damage to the fuselage and, and to the aircraft but they were able to egress off of the LZ. Uh, the, uh, as we uh, met, myself, uh, Major Bauer, and then we pulled in uh, Captain Foote, we kind of worked through the process of consolidating and reorganizing our forces on the ground to figure out what we're gonna do. Our original mission was to move south and link up at the AMP checkpoint with the chief, chief of police and sub-governor. That obviously wasn't gonna happen now because of uh, we're taking fire and we're really in the battle of our lives at this point, um, trying to seek cover. And on the HLZ, it, it was the only open spot uh, for miles around, but there was very limited cover and concealment down there. So you try to get around the rock and get cover well, you're taking, you get cover on one side, you're taking fire from the other side. And, go ahead. Did you say you basically were in the kill zone of an ambush? Yes. So it, yeah. was, a, it was a trap. It was a baited yeah. ambush yeah. where we, where they called for us and they told us, we want you guys mm -hmm. to come here. Yeah. All the while, they were, they were moving in and they were setting in defensive, dug in, set positions, waiting for us to come in so that they could ambush us. Yeah. yeah. It was a... Uh, it was a very political situation too, of course. Losing the district center at that point in time would have been a political nightmare. We had already lost it. We just didn't know it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So us going there to, to, to meet and try to save the district center was, was futile already. So um, that's just the way kind of things work in Afghanistan. Yeah. So then the... President Karzai is bought into this crap too. Then I, uh, I think he had that's a strong point. Whatever uh, he had bad, bad intelligence. Call it what you will, but yeah. By the time it gets to him, it's, it's he would, it, it, at best he was used. He was used at best. Yeah. The Taliban already had the valley. They just wanted some American heads to show for it. Yeah, and this was right. this was going to be a big win for the Taliban. Yeah, not only did they already have the district center, they were going to kill a bunch of Americans right. yeah. at the same time. Please. Yeah. Let's go. Uh, so estimates uh, estimates of the number of fighters were anywhere from 300 to potentially up to 600 fighters, <laughs> all dug in and set in. So. And you had how many? Uh, we had. 40, 38 U.S., 40 U.S., and uh, 20 A and A. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so. Ten more. Yeah. Initially, uh, my my JFO was the first one that started uh, eyeballing targets with because uh, we did have Apaches on. Uh, the close air support uh, F 16th at the time got called away for another tick prior to us getting there. Um, go ahead. Did you say something about the weather at that time, too, and the visibility? Uh, 
I'm trying to recall the weather. From, I, our, from our end, trying to look down, we couldn't see shit. It closed in. <laughs> uh, uh, really I know there was a lot of dust on the on yep. the HLZ, but uh, yeah, it it what we could see at the time was as the aircraft left is we could see Afghan National Police or what appeared to be police uh -huh. in uniforms were shooting at us. Yes. And my JFO said, hey, sir, we've got dudes in A&P uniforms, and they look like they're shooting at us. And I said, well, I'll take them out, shoot them. Mm -hmm. So uh, the uh, Apache aircraft, using their 30 mic mic and Hellfire missiles, we started engaging the enemy in the, in the village, uh, up in the mountains, and we immediately called for immediate cast to come and support our, our uh, troops in contact. Um, at that point, we consolidated, we got everybody together uh, to the point where we could start to move. And what we identified was just to the north, uh, just to the northeast of the LZ, uh, I, it probably was an estimated uh, four to five hundred meters, but up in the mountains, so we had to get, we had to move up. Uh, we moved up to some small collot formations and a cattle pen. So in Afghanistan, the, the goat herders, they use rock pens and they make basically like a hasty fence with mud to, to corral their, their uh, animals. Uh, there was also a mud hut that we used and, and two little mud huts. We got in there and we got basically into a strong point defense. Um, we set out our weapon systems, we set up our mortar systems where we could and we tried to defend as much as possible. So, what happened was the enemy, they, they just kept closing in on us, um, but it, it, it then lasted for a, the, a total of about seven hours. We just, uh, we dropped a lot of munitions. We did get immediate cast, so we had, we were the focus in Afghanistan. We got all of the close air support that was available coming in, and it was a big priority really for us on the ground to deconflict the airspace. So what happened was, is we, we, uh, the west side of the river, uh, we had Apaches, uh, and we focused our JFO, who was co controlling and helping uh, target those those enemy forces in the west side um, with uh, with the rotary aviation, the helicopters, uh, and then uh, anything that was on the east side, which could get to us basically because there was no river crossing. We utilized the close air support, and the JTAC and the Romad were just running around like crazy, ident identifying targets and then dropping 500 pound uh, and 2,000 pound GBU munitions on, on the enemy. Um, really our saving grace was that and combined with uh, our infantry, our inter infantry forces, we were, a, we were a shooting at targets, eliminating and d basically delaying the enemy, the overwhelming enemy from just basically getting up onto us. Enough time for our JTAC our ROMAD and our, uh, and our JFO to be able to drop these 500-pound uh, and 2,000-pound bombs uh, from close air support. So Were you able to get your snipers into any kind of advantageous position any time during this? Yes, I think that they did. Into the higher ridge lines? Uh, we, we tried to get, we tried to get uh, a, an overwatch position up a little bit higher so that we could be able to engage targets, at least have early warning on anything that was coming to the north mm -hmm. of us or to the east of us it would have been at that time, um, we had to pull them back, they were taking too much fire. So we had to get back down, but we did have, uh, our snipers were able from those clots, you know, they did the best that they could. And they were, they were in my understanding, they were hitting targets. They were, they were killing enemy. What right. elevation was the enemy at in relation to friendly forces? They were higher than us. They were all, it was- 400 feet or so? Yeah, it, they, it was plunging, I don't know for sure the exact, uh, elevation, but they had plunging fire down onto us. For, and it, for non-military people here, explain that the JTAC and all those three other things you said are basically forward observers for, yes. different, for different types of yes. fire support. Explain. Yeah. That. So uh, we we have one air we have two Air Force personnel that are with us, mm -hmm. and those two Air Force personnel is called we call it working in a joint environment, and they come and support us as infantry. So what they do is they have the ability to target, identify targets on the ground, and then something that infantry trip and army generally hasn't been able to do is use Air Force jets, close air support, uh, Air, Force, Air Force fighters, 
and then they can drop unit precision guided muni munitions or bombs, 500 pound bombs or 2,000 pound bombs on targets to eliminate targets for us in the infantry. So we work together to do that. Um, and then we have a joint fires observer, which is basically a forward observer on steroids. And what he is able to do is he's, a, he's an army forward observer that can, um, he can target with joint. Uh, uh, he does air to ground integration air, yes. basically. Mm -hmm. yep. he, can, he can control indirect fires from the mortar or artillery in conjunction with the rotary wing uh, Apaches and OH-58s. He ties all that together. So you really have, you really have consecutive circles. You have the infantry fighting the inner perimeter. You have the JFO fighting an outside perimeter of that nested with the JTAC, who's talking to the Air Force jets, eliminating targets of opportunity outside that second ring to so how do you communicate with each other and all that? I mean, how are you talking? It, it, was, it was chaos. Honestly, it was chaos. But what we did was we had tactical satellite or TACSAT that we used to communicate with our higher headquarters um, back in Meadowlong. Uh, and then we had FM radio to be able to communicate within our own group. And a lot of times, what I did, I just ran back and forth. I ran from one to the other one, and I was talking to Major Bauer, uh, and then talking to uh, Captain Foot, Lieutenant Pro Foot at the time. And so, so and so then, and I'm going to use the word FOs. So the so the FOs, which are really the Air Force FOs on the ground FOs, and then the JTAC you're talking about. I'm saying that so people know what FO is. But they had a, a high frequency radio to talk to the aircraft. Yes. Yep, they talk to the aircraft okay. through yep. high clear. frequency radio. And, and a lot, of, go ahead, sir. How did you get resupply with ammunition, or did you have enough? Yes, we both got it. Yes, that's a good question, sir. Uh, we, we, we ran pretty low on ammunition. Certain ammunition we were pretty much black on. Uh, we, we have what's called a speedball resupply, which is basically class five ammunition, and some class one was put into body bags. And then what it was is that, that we had resupply aircraft that came in, uh, UH-60s. Uh, they came in when it, the visibility went down a little bit and it got dark. They came in and they dropped, they basically pushed it out the door and drop it onto the HLZ. They couldn't get anywhere closer, they put it on the HLZ, and then we'd have to go down and get it. So it was, uh, it was very hasty, and those aircraft got shot up. So they had to get out fast because uh, they sustained some significant damage. Uh, but later on, uh, as, the, as the, the battle progressed and the enemy was getting pretty close to us, we were, we were holding our own by, by continuing to defend. Um, as darkness approached, uh, darkness then set in, we had the speedballs down there, and when it kind of got dark, we were able to send forces down to get it. But that's when uh, the ANA commandos and a special operations forces team was uh, air assaulted into the HLZ on Chinooks. Um, they, they didn't make it. They, not all of them made it. The second aircraft didn't make it because the first aircraft got shot up and sustained significant damage. So it was basically a team of four US, I think it was about four US special forces and then it was like 20 uh, ANA commandos. And so... No, the second aircraft, you say, it didn't make it. That, that insinuates they were shot, but they weren't. They, did, they, never they didn't go down, yeah. they didn't get shot. They just right. weren't able to okay. get down to the oh, HLZ the and, and drop off uh, soldiers. So Sorry. they went back. The other, both aircraft went back safely, uh, but we were only able to get half of our forces there that we wanted. Um, so at this time, darkness then sets in while they're on the HLZ, uh, and they're they're organizing because they've got a tough. These A and A commandos are pretty high speed, but they don't know what's going. They're A and A, so they're trying to get control of them. Afghan I'm sorry, National Afghan Army. National Army. I'm sorry. And yeah, these guys are a lot better than your standard troops. That yes, they're with. much better. They're high speed, but they still don't communicate well sure. and that sort of thing. So uh, at that time, uh, as I recall. The it, darkness set in. So when darkness sets in, we have a distinct advantage because we can see at night and we have optics and things with our technology that gives us a huge advantage. 
Um, so what happened was uh, they brought in an AC-130 Spectre gunship. Um, so if anybody's not aware of what that is, it's, it's an incredible machine. I mean, it's an aircraft that's an AC-130 that has a 105 millimeter howitzer uh, that just it points outside the back of the fuselage. And it also has a, a 25 millimeter chain gun, five barrel uh, rotary chain gun that, I mean, it just is incredible. And if my understanding is that it's all operated by a, a guy that's playing a video game in Nevada. And all they do is they, they circle around and you can hear it, you can hear it just circling around. And all it is is a guy that can see heat signatures. He can literally, with the advanced optics that it has, they can see people with, uh, with weapons. Yeah, little white dots running around. Yep. They can tell and what type of gear you're wearing as well. Yes. And they just started, they just started going to town on the enemy, quite honestly. They just started eliminating targets. They were shooting danger close to us. Did you have one or more? Yes, you had more than one, one thirty. Yes, sir. Yep. So when one, when one went uh, Winchester, which is out of right ammunition, out of they yeah. just flowed another one in, and then at, at a certain point, the enemy started egressing because we had gained the upper hand at that point. And as the enemy was running away with their weapons, we were just still hammering on them. I mean, they like punched just, them together too a little bit, which kind of helped. Yeah, they were just they they literally decimated the enemy at that point. Um, so we had gained the upper hand um, with optics and our sensors. We were able to identify that we that we killed at least two hundred about seventeen enemy, uh, and the rest had egressed out of the area up the valley. And they drugged their wounded with them. Uh, yes, sir. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There's nothing left after this. We've yeah, interrupted you. Uh, continue, continue on your thing, but uh, with your talk, but explain how cl how a danger close means and how close the bombs, the 500 pound and 2,000 bombs. That's were used. that's a good segue. So what I'm going to do is play this video, and as I do that, uh, danger close is when you drop a munition. Uh, within your uh, collateral dam damage estimate, which is where you, you may potentially have casualties by dropping the mun munition so close to your own forces mm -hmm. your burst, that you, that you radius. hurt yourself, mm -hmm. basically. Um, so we got down to the point where we believe the enemy was anywhere from 150 to 300 meters, basically, from us in our <laughs> strong point position. So what we had to do was, uh, my JTAC came to me, he's like, hey sir, this is what we have to do. Uh, we're danger close at this point. We pulled all of our ANA and US forces into a linear formation where we were at in our defense. Basically, if we had them up, up or down the mountain, we pulled them back to us. Uh, and then we dropped uh, munitions basically 150 meters from us. 500 pound bombs and to at the at this was at the at the worst to kill the enemy and uh, and then I, I have I do my my intel analyst caught video of it um, so I'll play this video yeah, for and you. He's in one of these little mud huts. What's worse? Yes. Than yeah. Him and I at this point are in the mud hut just trying to control the battle. Yeah. right there. This is our command post. Yeah. Crouching down, that's why the, the camera's looking at the floor. They're all crouching down. Okay, 
because the bomb's coming in. So it broke the, it broke the broke di diaphragm of the microphone. Yes. Okay. Yep. So talk us, tell us about that explosion. Did the dust fall from the ceiling? Did uh, you feel it, the it pressure? Was loud. You could feel the pressure. Yep. You could feel the pressure. Up. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and at that point, uh, we just continued fighting. And, and uh, I think we, at that point, you could kind of see the turning of the tide. We were, we were, some of those were fairly decimating to the enemy. And we were able to gain an upper hand. And also... It was a lot of timing issue because the, the darkness set in and when the darkness started to set in after this, we started gaining an, uh, a distinct advantage. Those are just those trying to landslides and those explosions? Okay. No. Just small ones? No, I, I think it, not that I noticed. Okay. Yeah. A, a lot of those you could see rocks flying. Yeah. And, and in fact, uh, with the AC-130, I, I remember uh, I, was, I had run over to the uh, Major Bowers hut and I was just sitting there, and I was kind of smoked, quite honestly, we were talking. And uh, shrapnel from the, from the AC-130 had, had landed on my gut, um, under, just under my uh, plates, oh, and it burned me. And I was like, holy oh, cow, this is, <laughs> that was, was <laughs> kind of woke me up there for a second. But, <laughs> so um, shrapnel from the AC-130, 25 millimeter bullets, or from the 105 From bullets, the 105 house, <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is what we had on, on station. We had F, F-16s, F-15s. We had Navy Super Hornets over there supporting us, H-64s and, and Apaches. Uh, basically, so the cost for doing that was pretty high. Um, so basically, after several hours, uh, Special Operations Forces and Commando were inserted, like we said. They then moved up after we gained the advantage, and they cleared that DOAB district center. So they went door to door, and they cleared it out. And once they had set up security, they basically, we became take on to them. Um, so then they called for us. We went down and got our resupply, basically resupplied so that we could have ammunition for follow-on operations in case something happened. And then we moved into the village. Uh, go ahead. At this time, didn't they tell you that uh, anybody from then on that was found in the valley was considered to be hostile? Because there were no friendlies left? Uh, I, I, I do kind of remember that. Any yeah. police are not really police, you may shoot them? Yeah, yeah, that was, that was for sure. I do remember that. Um, we, we went through and uh, very thoroughly the next day cleared the DOAT District Center again, and we found a, a lot of ammunition. We found a lot of police uniforms that they had been selling. Um, to just the Taliban that were in the area. We also cleared that village and the same thing we found Afghan police uniforms and we found thousands of rounds of ammunition up in the village. Uh, we sat down, I remember sitting down with the chief of police and the sub-governor who were, were still alive and, and they, they uh, it basically was almost an admittance of guilt. They, they, had, they were lying through their teeth about what had happened and um, and we could clearly tell that they were involved in baiting us into this ambush. So we basically put the whole thing, the, everything that happened on them, because it was of their fault, you know. Um, from that point on, it was several days. We set up security, um, but uh, we set up security, and then we had a follow-on force that included, uh, basically was, was charged by uh, 
Lieutenant Colonel Nixon um, came in and then they dealt with uh, kind of the aftermath, which would be a very difficult thing to deal with as well. Um, the day following, I do remember we had bodies stacked up outside of the infirmary, infirmary where we uh, basically set up kind of a base of operations and we started treating the Taliban casualties if we could. And then uh, we, we assisted the Taliban in getting their wounded out to further care further south in the valley if they wanted to move them down to Medrlam. Um What else did I got? It basically was the, the ordinance, go ahead. So did you lose men? Uh, no, we didn't. And, that, and that's what I was going to get into. We went through all this and uh, we had shrapnel abrasions. Uh, we had a few injuries, like a, 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 an ankle, and but we didn't lose anybody. No KIA, no real WIA. It, in my personal opinion, it's it's it it's a reflection back on my faith because it, it shouldn't. It, there's no way that it should happen that way. And. And any little thing that could have happened as a reflection, like a, a medevac, if somebody had gotten shot or, or injured, a, a mortar round or a rocket that would have hit in a spot where we, we took casualties. Yeah, anybody would have been wounded, you know, at a, more than a routine injury, and they would have not have survived. Mm -hmm. it, it did just, you have medic, medics with you? We did, yep. We had, uh, I don't recall the number, I think we had two medics, mm -hmm. maybe. Uh, explain who one of the medics was. Uh, the, the battalion commander's son, was he up there? What was his job? Yeah. Ben Carrell? Oh, oh, yeah, Wade was there. Commander's Wade, son? Yeah. Wade Carrell was there, yeah. yeah. And he was Explain the medic, that yeah. a little bit, because there's Wade. more. So the, so the brigade commander sent, sent his son into the into the jaws of death, basically. Yes. Explain that. Yeah. I'm he, sure did. He, he probably didn't know. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he told his wife. Yeah. <laughs> No, yeah. it's easy to do. Yeah. He, he had no idea who was going in there. Uh, he yeah, actually sent his, uh, his son into the jaws of death. Yeah, yeah. Wade, Wade went, and, uh, and uh, just like everybody else, he did an outstanding job. The, uh, the courage, bravery, uh, valor that was, was there is just incredible. Those, uh, you know, when you're in the fight, nobody's concerned about their own safety. They're just fighting the fight using adrenaline in their training, and and engaging the enemy just to survive, and you don't think about it. When I look back at him now, I was like, holy cow, that really happened. It gets worse. Yeah. <laughs> so so um, in the scheme of things, looking back, someone might know, but has there been battles like this before where you, where you killed over 200 Taliban? Has that ever happened with any other American forces? I, I, it probably has. I don't know if we've ever had people that actually survived. There's been some them. stuff up there in that area that's happened in Nuristan and uh, Nangarhar that are that were serious, serious battles that we've almost gotten overrun. And in one case, we actually the Americans did pretty much get overrun. That's but, where that guy got the Medal of Honor. I know that. Yeah. But as far as this period of time in Afghanistan, there had been nothing like this for a considerable amount of time, and it really didn't go over very well. There, if you kill more than a certain amount of people, it, it creates a, a Department of the Army investigation, basically. And for General Petraeus and General Allen to have that happen under their watch, they want to blame someone. So. When you have that amount of casualties that you have created, you've, you've created a lot of chaos. Do you have enemy casualties? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Or the Cold War. Was this where, um, during the time where the whole Bo um, Bergdahl thing was? Well, was I don't remember that. He was still out there at that time. This was, uh, this, was, uh, this, was, uh, this, was uh, this was after Osama bin Laden right had their casualties. So, no, at, the same question, time, at the same was, time, we're getting ready to turn over, <laughs> and we are having transfers of authority at the same time, right. handing over districts and provinces and the government to the, and then all our facilities to the Afghans. So this is happening at the same time. So did, 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 if this was a concern of the government and the, uh, Petraeus' office, did someone come down and investigate sure. your uh, Yeah, of course. You know, and, and they General, sent, Carell, uh, they General sent, Carell can tell you some of the ass chewings that he took verbally that were 
extreme. Because you killed too many enemy? Because we weren't there in the first place and because we didn't kill too many enough enemy. Well, we never had the economy of force or the luxury to go up and actually own that district center. We had our hands full with what we had. No, no. And we couldn't go into Nuristan with the footprint that it took to try to guard that terrain and help them. So we got our ass handed to us for not being there. Yeah. We got our ass handed to us for going there and killing that many people. And then really, when it was all over, we just pretty much left anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like one of those hills you see in Vietnam or World War II. You go take yeah. the hill and then you leave it. And then you go take the hill, same hill again. Very, very much similar. It's okay. a very you frustrating. It was a very you frustrating the chief war. Of police and, uh, uh, the Afghan officials. Nothing ever bad happened to them, right? They just. I I don't know what actually happened to them, but I do know when the A and the Afghan army went in there, they were not friendly with them. And actually, I, I had left, and uh, Colonel Nixon had gone in there. He probably can speak to that a little bit more. Well, we would do a meeting every morning with uh, those two guys, and it became clear they wanted to blame us for killing innocent people and this, that, and the other thing, and, and I had already, I just put it back on them, look, you lost your district, you colluded as far as I'm concerned with the, with the Taliban, mm -hmm. you led us into an ambush, mm -hmm. and I have nothing to say to you, and you have no position here to demand anything, and then the major that was with the Kandak, because we had the interpreter going, he just jumped on full board. And to be honest with you, those guys are still in the area. They never came back for another meeting with me, which was good. Okay. Now, the one thing that, and of course, nothing I did compares to that, but I was, was it, you guys were there like seven days, and I was there seven days? I can't remember. It was, I don't even remember. I don't know the days, but we went in and kind of secured the place. And uh, the thing that I happened to me that I wasn't expecting is I got invited over to the, uh, it wasn't the, it was Afghan National Police, but it was like their commandos that came in, some mm -hmm. special police. And I went over for a meeting, and we're in the office, and anyway, next thing I know, I get led around behind the building, I come in on one end, and it's a narrow hallway, and there must have been 175 to 100 elders sitting there, and I, did they have rule of law? Somebody from they, the, they, the, the, the DOAB district. They had, basically, their love, their attorneys. Right. Basically, so this were. attorney was here, and then I get a camera stuck on my face, and everybody's again mm. telling me how we killed all these missing people. Well, they claimed to set up a deal then. Yeah, they, 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 they yeah. wanted compensation. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, again, I this happened all over where they would ask for restitution for yeah. any casualties to pay their families. Um, even for the Taliban that we killed, not right. just for the, but also you're killing people that are supposedly Afghan national police, which they're entitled to, I don't know, 10,000 bucks, I think their lives are worth, but it, it's, uh, yes, sir. Uh, did it anybody is. ever tell y'all what that was all about? As far as uh, what it was all about, as far as yeah, the, why, why, why there, we did it? Why was it all about? I think uh, no. We you never never talk to you about that. No, we never really got any good an set answers. We all make our own assumptions about what happened and who did what and, and that sort of thing. So I might add too. This is the most beautiful place I'd ever been in Afghanistan. It was absolutely gorgeous there. Mm -hmm. They had a right through the middle of this valley was this fast moving That's river, cool. clear water. Um, we had. Uh, there was a, basically a straight cliff up several hundred meters on the one side that we walked into. I mean, that, all they had to do was stay at the top and drop hand grenades. They would have had fun, but it was a gorgeous place. Mm -hmm. Now, you can go back in history and read about Nuristan province, sir, to answer some of your questions. Huh? So the province that they were fighting in, their main economical commerce is timber, trees, forestry. Well, of course, all, all I know so is they, from what I have read, and then from my own personal experience yeah. in World War II yeah. in Italy, and uh, we moved on down. And those crowds were supposed to be our enemy, 
But I, yeah, but they were good old boys. Sure. I'm about half proud myself. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you make you make a good point. These people are trying to protect protect their own area. So in nurse stand specifically, their number one trade is lumber. So Karzai says you can no longer cut down trees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now you're So they have no income. Yeah, I don't know. But they're like, we don't belong to you. We're Nuristan. Yeah. So, yeah, they're protecting their own rights. Which, if you drill down, there's a pro there's a problem for everything, and it's political. But we get caught in the middle of it, and we don't win on either side. No, you don't. No, I'm just, I'm just playing old Buck Private, yep. looking at him one and all that, doing what I'm told to do. And, That's right. And, and I've read a lot of stories since then, and who promoted you? Yeah. And who promoted Pearl Harbor? Yeah. And who promoted the Germans did not do a cotton picking thing to this country? Okay, why did we have to go kill our own people? See? And these things yeah, they were a little outside their boundary. Take it on me a long time to figure out. Yeah. Well, okay, how, what's your, how do we wrap this up? Are you? I think I I think I'm good. If there's any other questions, tell me this. Uh, was there anyone that received? <laughs> Uh, nice. Awards yes. or citation for, yeah. for their nice. work during this battle. That's yes, our, our J Tech, Tavis Delaney, the high speed guy that was in there, one in charge of the hill, uh, he, he received the Silver Star for this. Uh, the, uh, my JFO, uh, Luke Chatfield, received a Bronze Star with Valor device. And a JFO is a uh, Joint Fires Observer, oh, our forward ours. observer. He's an Army guy from Floyd, Iowa. And then our. Uh, and then the uh, Romad, who was basically the right hand man of the JTAC, the well, tactical air controller. He's, an Air, Force he's guy. the Air Force guy. He got a Bronze Star with Valor device. And then there were several uh, ARCOM, Army Accommodation Medals with Valor device that were awarded for this. And, and that's awarded at battalion or brigade level? Uh, the ARCOM with Valor, I think, is higher than that. Yeah, division, at least. Yeah, yeah. division, yeah. yeah. <coughs> okay. So, all right, that's good. Yeah. Well, my conclusions. Question? If we give you an email address, could we get an email copy of the slide set? Yes. Yes, of course. I have a slide deck. I'll give it to anybody if you want to look at it. it okay. I'm, I'm sorry it didn't work out. It's got a lot more information in it. Can um, you post it yeah, on the um, Facebook page? Yes. yes. Yep, you can do that. Yep. Okay. Well, yeah. just scrubbing for security, of course. Uh, would you uh, flip that light on back there in the, in the first uh, first one on the side wall there? We, uh, we just want to thank him for Major Gingrich for coming and giving this brief. We're going to go ahead and present him with one of these hats. And there's a couple there's a couple things. One, um, the reason why these guys. Uh, were successful and didn't take any casualties is because of his leadership. And two, it's because they're Red Bulls. Yep. Right? Yep. Yeah. That's right. Thank you.